equivalent of creation, the tort alleged by Steve Wolf. So we're on chapter 17 now. Uh, if you've got your book, you have ordered it, you can follow along. And it's chapter 17, Turning the Tide. Reg was waiting under the hatch that led to the vertical conduit when he heard the special knock knockety knock that he and Zodiac had agreed upon. The former wolfman pushed up the hatch and Zodiac crawled on inside the tight tunnel. Magnet is in place and it's actually working, Zodiac said, securing the panel above his head. Reg nodded and scampered away to instruct Bernard and Austin that they were now in pet play. He wondered why Zodiac had had any doubts about whether his plan would work. Within minutes, Reg crawled up behind Austin and tapped him on his shoulder. It's up to you now, you and Mark now. Good luck. Austin acknowledged a strange new Reg and then rolled his eyes upward as he turned into the GPS signal. Are you ready, Are you ready Bernard? Kneeling on two cushions. Bernard hauled the ropes over his broad shoulders and pulled them taut. Ready to navigate, Austin. Austin began to beep. Got one bar. Now two. Waiting. Reg twitched with agitation. Come on, Craig. If we don't change course soon, Captain Tinfoil will realize something is wrong. Austin didn't answer. Craig! The next ten seconds felt like an eternity. Reg feared that his plan was about to completely unravel. Waiting was all Austin could say. Feeling desperate, he slapped Austin on the back jolting the human GPS system from its software glitch. Beep three, beep four bars, beep five. Got a full signal, said Austin. Navigate, Reg cried. Bernard, pull the starboard, please, said Austin. Bernard looked up with a blank expression. Which way is that? Reg put his head in his hands. Right, Bernard, pull on the left rope, Austin commanded. Bernard heaved on the left rope and the runner post slowly turned. Austin appeared to sense the directional change. That's great, Bernard, a little more. Now, hold it, perfect. Now please pull the right rope, Bernard, and straighten the rudder. Bernard obeyed. Austin turned to Reg. We are now on course for Mother's Landing. Reg sighed and smiled. Well done, Craig, well done, Mark. I'll send Alan up to, as a communications runner. Reg turned and crept along the conduit. Once he was out of earshot, Austin piped up. I really miss the old Reg. I can, can't do with all these daft names. And yeah, you and me both. Bloody Mark, Craig, Allen. I think when all this is over, we should crack him over his head and maybe the old Reg will reappear. Over several hours, the two friends continued to hijack the ship safe in the knowledge that Captain Tinfoy Boyle had no idea. Up under the helmsman's shutter, shelter, Univon Steelett glanced at the compass and nodded his approval as a now manipulated compass pointed them towards Yellowstein Port. Captain Tinfo appeared over Univon's shoulder at the compass and looked out to sea. They were holding a steady course, and, but still he had an uneasy feeling that something wasn't quite right. It had been two days since Reg had implemented his plan, and it was working like a well-oiled machine. When Bernard tired, Derek and Barry stepped up and held a rope apiece to keep the boat steady while well, Bernard had a few hours rest. Austin I was not afforded the luxury of a long break, so Derek would take instructions from him, buying him an hour's sleep in his bunk every now and then, and the longer they ran the risk of burying too far off course. Austin, exhausted, remained in the cabin relaying the navigational shifts through Stan. Up on deck, Captain Tinfoil paced up and down like a horizontal yo-yo, much to Univon's universe's annoyance. He was completely unaware that they were traveling in the wrong direction, but still, his instinct screamed at him that something was wrong. It was an itch that had forced him to check on Team Cogs and Clocks on several occasions. He had gone down to their holding room and viewed the team through the food hatch. Knowing they were being watched, the team had ordered Colin to watch the helm. Peering through the lip of the hatch on the deck, complete with a picnic, the cook was comfortable at his post. 
Every time the captain disappeared, he would warn the team and all but Bernard would scurry back to their cabin before the captain peered through the hatch. Each time, everything appeared normal, except for Stan's feet hanging from the rafters and someone always asleep in a bed, a figure the captain was unable to make out. But the numbers were correct. Under a collection of threatening dark clouds, the suspicious captain fingered his long beard and watched Univon steer the ship. Dario quacked. Master Univon, aye, Captain. When did you last have a break? Captain Tinfo asked, watching the compass. Thirty-six hours ago, Captain. But uh, I'm not counting. Captain Tinfo guessed. Even Dario gave Univon a, an uncomfortable stare. Good grief! Why have you been on for so long? No one relieved me. Are you not tired? A look of hope flickered in Univon's eye. A little. Could do with a toilet break. Before Captain Tinfo could respond, a cry rang out from the crow's nest. Land ahoy! Captain Tinfo patted Univon on his shoulder and passed him a bucket. That'd be good work, my boy. The captain scurried out of the shelter and onto the deck. The air was hazy and damp, and a cold breeze swept across his body. Through the mist of the new dawn, he smiled and looked out across at the lights of what he believed was Yellowstone Port. Drink time. Ah, oh, that'd be good grog. Yeah, right, of course it was. Austin had been asleep for approximately 50 minutes when Derek nudged him. A flicker in his eye suggested that the GPS whiz kid was coming around. We'll land at Mother's Landing in around two hours at our current speed and course, blurted Austin as he woke from a dream that involved cycling shoes and a pair of rubber gloves. Stan relayed the message to the team. Well done, Reg. Yeah, nice one, Reg, Connell agreed. Derek shook his head and smiled. I must admit I had my doubts, but you proved me wrong. Reg looked up and rolled his eyes. Reg, my name is Steve! A series of coughs ricocheted around the room. Reg sighed. Anyway, the hardest part of my plan is about to unfold. Oh? And what's that? Stan asked. Getting off the ship with our lives and our bikes. I wish I'd never asked. Woohoo, sounds like it could get juicy. Reg paused for effect. Yes, it could. Our bikes are stored at the bow of the ship in a crate. Derek jumped off his bunk and stared at the pirate that was in Stan's bed, snoring like a jackhammer. We may need this, then. He drew the pirate's sword in front of the sheath. He then appeared to lose himself, thrusting and swinging the sword with one hand behind his back while he skipped forwards and backwards, shouting, Aha! Reg caught a glint of light dancing on the edge of the sword as the point of the blade almost sliced his nose off. I think the room may be a little too small for sword practice. Derek and his element grabbed the pirate's hat and flipped it onto his head. I've always wanted to be a pirate. Really, I would never have guessed, Barry said with a wry smile. Nervous adrenaline seeped into Derek's bloodstream and his eye lit up. Why couldn't the pirate play cards? That was not a good time for joke. For a joke, Derek Rich said with total sincerity. The captain was standing on the deck. The morning haze began to lift as the sun hauled its way upwards. Derek quacked. Dario quacked his appreciation from the shoulder of Captain Tinfoil, who was looking across to see at what he thought was the Ellis Tangerine lazily cutting through the water some 400 meters away. And its appearance was no different from the Ellis Flincher. Around, the nadir, and around an hour later, the nagging itch Captain Tintoil had felt for some time intensified. He rolled out his masts and checked them against the coastline. Like a teenager who had just been caught with his dad's monkey magazine, he gasped and horror filled his soul. Unibon, he barked. We be not in the correct position. But the compass shows us heading northwest, said Unibon. 
jumping upright, having almost fallen asleep. Dario quacked harshly and pecked at the cabin boy. We'd be heading towards Mother Landing, Captain Tinfoil screamed. Startled, Dario flapped his wings and deposited a fistful of feathers onto the deck. Tinfoil darted across the helm and examined the compass more closely. Unibon! Aye, Captain? Why, there be a magnet attached to the underside of the compass. Unibon shrugged helplessly. In a moment of uncontrollable rage, Captain ripped the offending magnet from its hiding place and crushed it under his foot. Unibon's eyes widened as the compass needle returned to its correct position. Tinfoil re-examined the now fully functional compass. They had indeed been sailing northeast, not northwest, 100 miles away from Mother's Landing. Tinfoil glared at Unibon. That be definitely Mother's Landing. Er, uh, and how do you suppose the magnet got attached itself to the compass? Unibon gulped, his legs shaking. Captain Tinfoil suddenly became dark. He didn't need a bucket anymore. A dark patch appeared around his groin. We uh, had a visitor the other night who threatened me, but I didn't actually see him or see or her put that there, he blurted. Captain Tinfoil and Dario stared at the helpless cabin boy. Quack! Yeah, Dario, we have indeed been had, Tinfoil said. He turned back to Unibound, his mood now dark and controlled. I'll be dealing with you later. Get me men ready. I feel there be an insurrection coming. Captain Watershed of the Ellis Tangerine was overseeing her docking procedure at Galstain Fort. His big warty hands rested on the deck rail and his posture projected an unwelcoming air. Unlike his peers, Captain Watershed's appearance was more akin to a builder than a pirate. He wore trousers that failed to cover his permanently exposed rear end, and around the front they fought a losing battle against the heavy onslaught of his protruding belly. He had lost so many buttons that they had resorted to using thin rope to hold his trousers up. His hair and wayward beard were greasy and unkempt. Despite this, and for some strange reason, he believed he was God's gift to women. The scruffy, overweight sea dog attempted a toothless smile in the direction of Team Lipstickson's shoes as they disembarked on a thin plank and stood on the quayside awaiting their bikes. Repulsed by the captain's leering, they turned away and ignored him as a small wooden deck crane at the bow of the ship dropped a crate of bikes onto the dockside. Captain Watershed looked back out to sea with a look of mild concern, wondering where the Ellis potato pie was. But after several seconds, he decided he didn't give a damn and resumed smiling at the girls who were standing and attending to the bikes. Staring at her surroundings whilst disembarking, Starlet instantly realized that they were not where they were meant to be. She held the team together. We have been duped. This is a mother's landing. This is somewhere else. How rude of them to bring us somewhere else, Misty said, looking around the dingy port. Where exactly is somewhere else? Star so surveyed the area, the smell of tobacco, and the rundown buildings were typical of the decay of only one place, and she shuddered. A stain of something evil was ever present, and the silence was intimidating. As if anything or anyone could appear out of the shadows and threaten them at any moment. Looking around, Starlet slowly whispered, This is Yellowstone Port, once the home of the worst pirate who ever existed, Marco Yellowstone. We are approximately 100 miles off course. Misty stamped her foot and a curl of her hair tightened. I'm going to write a strongly worded letter when we get back. This is cheating. How will we ever make up the time? And who is Marco Yellowstone? Starless peachy face wrinkled. It was a look that she saved for the most undesirable of people. Marco Yellowstone had a pension for cigarettes and grog, and he would resort to anything to acquire them. After an altercation involving a merchant ship many years ago, Marco had gone too far 
and attempted to relieve the captain of his life. He was sent to eternity on the underside of the ledge. However, after a few hundred years, he found a way to Earth and disappeared beneath the waves of the Atlantic Ocean. Mother Nature knows he's hiding in the theft, but she's decided he can live in fear and of never resurfacing again. There are rumors of an underwater city, but nothing has ever been proven. The girls, for the most part, were full of anger, while some were a little upset. Captain Warshed watched from his perch on the deck of his ship, and for a tiny little so second, he felt pity towards the girls, but his empathy soon evaporated when he reminded himself of the ton of gold sitting in his hold for a job he considered, in his own words, to have been well done. As he continued his lonely lusting over the ladies, he felt a sudden blow to his head. Stumbling backwards, he fell unconscious to the planks. The slow descent from standing tall to a mess of human blubber sprawled out in an unfashionable pose on the deck was near perfect modern art. And before any of them could react, the scurvy sea dogs building around on deck felt the full force of a blunt object as it smashed into their heads with a sickening thud, knocking them to the wooden deck dazed and confused. Modified arrows with blunt, square pieces of metal attached to the ends lay randomly around the deck. A door burst open from underneath the forecastle desk, deck as a, and a line of lemmings, the pirates, stormed out of the... I'm going to read that again. I'm sorry. Uh, and a door burst open from underneath the forecastle deck, and like a line of lemmings, a pirate stormed out of the little opening, shouting, Arr! And shiver me timbers! While waving swords, axes, and hammers, and run straight into a second barrage of barrels that arched from the trees on the shore. Within seconds of how a pirate rubble completed the art exhi exhibition, the beret-wearing critics of the nonsensical world, or the, sorry, nonsensical art world, would perhaps have been inclined to award the work go on for originality or something, <coughs> then again, they might just drink an expensive wine and talk shit. What's going on, Missy cried as two horse-drawn carriages bolted out from the thick foliage of the dense forest that bordered the derelict fort. They careered at speed into the open before coming to an abrupt halt. The two stagecoach drivers, perched high on their buggy benches, nodded at one another. They had an aura of authority about them as well as nice matching blue uniforms and shiny polished boots. They also sported little gleaming shields that were pinned to their jackets. The doors of the coaches swung open. Can you please get into the carriages, commanded a voice that was unsure whether or not the order was a little too harsh. Five men with bows dropped from the trees. They too had the same air of authority and sparkling blue uniforms. Surround the carriages, they took up positions and guarded the team. Charlotte smiled as she remembered the note from Mother Nature and looked up into friendly eyes of the lead driver. Good to see you, Administrator Copperfeather. Good to see you as well, but time is of the essence. Cop Copperfeather replied, bouncing off his buggy bench and saluting awkwardly. Hello, George, Starlet shouted across to the other driver. Good day to you, Starlet, George replied, climbing down from the stagecoach. The two stagecoach drivers loaded the bikes onto bike racks, fitted on the back of the carriages, ushered the girls on board. A gift from Mother Nature, said Starlet, climbing into the coach. Copperfeather gasped and stared at Starlet. A gift? Surely not. Starlet smiled and Copperfeather's bald head creased. She was beautiful and Copperfield, Copperfeather was, well, just a copper. Really, said Starlet with a smile, and you just happen to have a bike rack fitted as well? Well, you never know when they might be needed. And you just happen to be passing? Oh, of course, me and George always pass this way and around this time on this particular day. Don't we, George? George nodded and waved from his buggy bench. Well, we are lucky girls today, aren't we? Copperfeather's face turned red, and he snapped the door shut behind Starlet. 
He turned to the five archers and gave them orders to secure the ship, tie up the crew, and book them in, book them in the with administrator Hopthorns for re-education. The friendly-faced lawman then climbed down to his own buggy and bench, grabbed the reins, and ushered the four horses forwards. George followed, and they disappeared at speed down the narrow, dusky trap and into the dense canopy of trees. Once we dock, we have to be quick, said Reg, replacing the small panel, and without any thought to the direction of the ring of the wood in the ceiling of their room. Beside the conduit, Team Cogs and Clocks dressed in their cycling gear, slithered one by one along the narrow deck, narrow space towards the vertical conduit that led up to the deck. Up on the top deck, and in disguise, Zodiac waited for them. He needed to unload the bikes and without being detected. Woohoo! I can't wait to ride my bike! Stan! Derek said. Sorry, I just can't wait. <coughs> Excuse me, I need another drink. Captain Tinfoil and his band of armed pirates waited outside King Kaiser Clock's cabin. Tinfoil knew that they had somehow deceived him, and he was taking no chances. With Dario, Patch, and Scar in tow, he burst into the team's room, waving his sword and shouting, Arr! By the room empty, except for the snoring pirate, Tinfoil prodded the slumbering sea dog with his sword. The pirate didn't move. Tinfoil kicked the bunk and turned to Patch and Scar with a sinister look in his eye. Find them and bring me the stir scurvy dogs to me, he roared. Patch and Scar gulped and nodded before darting out of the room. Captain Tinfoil's eye scanned the cabin. Dario hopped off his perch as the captain moved the beds and built the wall for loose panels. Nothing. He peered inside the tiny bathroom. Nothing. How did he get out, he shouted, turning over a chest of drawers in frustration. The ship had almost docked, and he knew he would have the fury of Buck's Wad to deal with. He needed to know how they did it, how they had deceived him. He patted his hands across the walls. Nothing. Punching a wall, he screamed in agony, rolling his eyes upwards. Then he spotted it. A small square in the ceiling looked odd. The grain of the wood was lying in a different direction than the rest. Tinfoil smiled. I've got you now, you salty dogs! Climbing up into the rafters, he pressed the tip of his sword gingerly against the panel. It moved to the side easily, and he peered inside. The conduit was empty. Tinfoil clambered up out into the small space, with Dario fluttering up in behind. He cursed at himself. He should have known about the conduits of his own ship. He inched his way along the horizontal corridor, smiling a evil grin. Ye be mine now. He hissed, frothing at the mouth as Dario quacked. The yellow splinter pulled onto the into the docks, and Buxwab made his way on the prop poop deck and glanced across the harbor. His blood began to boil. Morris, he bellowed. Within seconds, the bulk of Morris Hammer burst through a door and sidled up against him. What is a ship doing here, said Bucks, angrily foaming from his mouth. Morris scratched his huge forehead and strained his tie. I don't know. Bucks Wad thumped the handrail. Well, you had better hope Captain Tinfoil delays them. Morris remained silent, a deadly steely look glinted in his eyes. Without any warning, he launched himself over the rail and landed on the deck. A very long way down, and rolled out of the fall, springing to his feet. Where are you going? Bucks thundered, amazed that Morris hadn't created a human-sized crater. I'm going to insist that Captain Tinfoil delays them. As the Ellis tail pie finished his stocking maneuver, Zodiac, still in disguise, loaded the large crate housing the bikes onto a small wooden crane a rickety contraption consisting of wooden pulleys and a strong steel cable. Being the oldest person on the ledge, Zodiac had developed keen situational awareness skills, and they were now screaming at him. He scanned the deck, feeling the sudden urgency of the pirates. 
They appeared too busy to question what he was doing, but he says that this gig was about to burst at seams. Without hesitation, Zodiac winched up the crate, pushed the long arm over the side of the ship, and lowered the bikes onto the dock. Satisfied they were secure, he crept along the deck to the hatch and lifted it up. The administrator was greeted by a face full of bread. Morning, Colin had reached the hatch first. He nodded at Zodiac and then nodded to Austin, who nodded to Bernard, who nodded to Barry, who nodded to Stan, who nodded to Derek, and finally Derek nodded to Reg, who nodded back at him. One by one, the team filtered out on the deck, bent double, and scurried for cover. It comprised several barrels stacked on the edge of the deck. At the end of the line, Reg waited patiently as Derek squeezed up the conduit towards the hole. A cold chill of terror filled Reg's underpants. Someone was behind him. So he craned his head around and shuddered as Captain Tinpo's evil, evil grin came into view. Are you going somewhere? Reg, wide-eyed with terror, cried, Ah! And as Derek cleared the hole, Reg scampered up the conduit, nearly dodging the point of tinfoil swords. Hurry up, he screamed. We have company. On hearing Reg to scream, Zodiac knew time had struck zero and their gig was exposed. Captain Tinfoil bellowed from down below in the conduit. Get them, lads! They be escaping! Patch and Scar burst out into the deck. Patch, let's get them. Get who? The prisoners, you idiot. Who'd you think? All right. As Zodiac yanked Reg out of the hatch, the point of the captain's sword caught his lighter shorts, cutting a hole in the stretchable fabric. A deafening quack followed, and Dario's exploded up, and Dario exploded out of the small hatch seconds later. Raising Reg's arm, the crazy duck spun in the air and turned to the attack. Reg was in Dario's sights. Quack! The menacing duck dive bomb towards the fray, framing his beak and pecked at Roger's, Reg's head so violently that blood began to ooze from his wounds. For good measure, the bird slapped his exposed scalp with its webbed feet. Reg reached for the duck with one hand, the other raised and ready to strike. Keep still, Reg, yelled Bernard. Or sorry, Steve, Steve, don't move. Reg obeyed, and he felt something small skim the top of his thinning thatch. A small ball bearing struck Dario right between the eyes, and the bird fell unconscious to the deck with a sickening thud. Reg looked back at Bernard and nodded his acknowledgement as the big lad reloaded his Diablo. Come on, said Zodiac, rushing Reg towards the bow of the ship and onto the forecastle deck where the rest of Team Cods and Fox were waiting. Arr, you be surrounded, said Captain Tinfoil as the scruffy captain hauled himself out of the hole in the deck. Zodiac and the team looked from the captain to the quayside far below. Seeing the team were cornered, the pirates advanced on them, blocking the exit. Well, it's been nice knowing you all, Colin said, pulling out a rock-hard stick of French bread. Anyone fancy a last meal? Form a semicircle, Reg commanded. He then whispered into Derek's ears, Do you still have Colin's chef's hat? Derek's eyes spun in excitement. He nodded a sly smile and felt for the hat in one of his pockets on his cycling shirt and unfolded the white headpiece. Creeping up behind Colin, he placed the hat firmly on his head. Within seconds, the hat tightened around Colin's head and froth foamed at his mouth, and the calm, collected chef metamorphosed into an uncontrollable, angry lunatic. Team Cogs and Clocks formed a semicircle where Bernard loaded up his Diablo and raised it, poised to fire. Colin the Mad Chef, his eyes an angry shade of red, swung his hard member of, bre member of bread by only screaming, Get back or I will fucking kill you! With his adrenaline pumping, Derek grew his sword, arched his back with his chin held high, and began thrusting the sword backwards and forward his other hand firmly behind his back as he skipped from one foot to the other. Barry, Stan, Austin, and Reg raised their fists, and the pirates laughed. Arr, did you think you were ever going to get away, said Tinfoil? Well, yes, Stan shouted as nervous 
energy pumped his bravado. Really? Well, yeah. Captain Tinfoil stopped, spotting his pet duck sprawled across the deck. He screamed in terror, Diablo! He raced towards the stricken beard bird. His eyes burned with an anger that could have melted an iceberg. Whoever did this, he whispered with evil intent, is in real trouble. Tinfoil picked up Dario and placed him on a crate, resting his head on a soft, rolled up rag. Pirates! he yelled. Advance. All right, next one is chapter 18, cleared for takeoff. So we're, we're, we're almost at the end of the pirate thing. And I think, let me see, 19. There's a lot to the pirates. I think that must have been Steve's favorite one. So we are done with this for today. I appreciate you being here. I look forward to reading the next chapter to you. And that should be another about three or four days. I've been taking a little long because I've been doing other things, finishing up a book of my own called The uh, Sheriff in a Small Town, which I hope to have out sometime in the very near future. I'll read some more. Uh, excuse me. I'm, this might be Brog because it's supposed to be coffee, but uh, I'm not sure. Anyways, that will be out in the near future. And I'll read uh, especially one part of but a drunk horse that we'll get into the next time I get with you. So anyway, that's it for today. I appreciate you being here. Take care of yourselves. Be good to yourself. And I'll see you on the next reading. Thanks again. Bye.